if you're an agent with without a formal bank account, <laughs> are I, I just you in knew bre- someone was going to ask me about are this. You are you in you. breach <laughs> of the client money protection laws? Maybe. Um, I mean, obviously, agents don't have to have client bank accounts as long as they don't collect client money. Yes. So it's perfectly possible, lawfully, to operate an agency and never touch money. Mm. I've actually had clients who've looked at this using Stripe. Mm. Um, technically, if you do that, arguably, you don't get classed as a letting agent at all. Because of the way, but if you don't touch any money, depending yeah. on what you do, it's perfectly possible to operate in what most people would think of as a letting agency, but actually bypass quite a lot of the legislation yeah. if you don't touch any of the money. Yeah. And it is possible to set up using Stripe situations now where where um, tenants pay their rent direct to the landlord, bypassing the agent completely. I mean, obviously this has enormous advantages from agents' perspective of HMO licensing, which is all t- t- tucked around money. Mm. So there, mm. there are potential, I mean, I, I, how successful these would be is another matter, but there are arguments that you could make that, that say that you're not an agent for the purpose of the legislation. The difficulty we've got and what you're alluding to is the fact that increasingly agents are having real trouble obtaining a bank account. From a traditional uh, bank. From a bank or building society um, that is a pooled client account because banks and building societies simply don't understand the JMLSG um, AML guidance. Now, what's really crazy about this is HMRC agrees with you. They think that banks don't understand the JMLSG guidance. They've had meetings with senior banks where they've said, you don't understand the guidance. And the bank's response to this at senior level is to say, this doesn't happen. So there are no in high street banks who, if I made and t- said their names, people would be shouting at the screen going, they won't give me a pool client account, where the bosses of those banks are telling HMRC that they absolutely will allow absolutely. pool client accounts. So the difficulty is that that and, the, and HMRC are beating their head against the wall because they are they are being bluntly obstructed by banks who don't actually appear to know what is going on in their own branches. Now that it's not the first time we've heard that story, I hasten to add. Um, I mean, uh, uh, money laundering <laughs> comes to mind again in this context. In, in I mean, there's the famous case of a major international bank that was laundering money for one at, for for, for uh, El Chapo Guzman and apparently didn't appear to know that their branches yes. in Mexico were laundering the money as fast as they could do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it has been documented, but I'm, I'm again not naming the name uh, because because they dispute this 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 way of, uh, this, <laughs> they, they they substantially dispute that 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 uh, interpretation of events. You've got enough on your plate. And I've got enough yeah. problems this week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is that the legislation that requires agents to have a client redress scheme says in it that that client account has to be with a bank or building society. And if you bore through all the sub-legislation, the type of accounts that you're referring to, which are EMIs, so electronic electronic money, money. don't count as bank or building society accounts. Now, as it happens, I think the government has this wrong. When they drafted the legislation, EMIs already existed and they should have brought them in as part of it. EMIs are, in fact, um, safer than banks because EMIs are required to have exactly the amount of money that's on deposit uh, held with the treasury or a major or a major agreed bank. So, so in fact, uh, an EMI, if it has my 10 grand, is required to have 10 grand sitting in a bank. Now, the difficulty with it is the FSCS doesn't apply to EMIs. Um, so if the, the MI, financial compensation the, the financial scheme. services compensation mm. scheme, which guarantees you up to eighty thousand pounds worth of compensation yeah. if your bank collapses, doesn't apply to EMI. So if your EMI collapses, um, you got then, then the money will take longer to come back because the FSCS doesn't have has has time guarantees about how quickly it will provide money, and it's fourteen days for most people, is quite quick. Mm. Um, and I, I think they extend it to a month if it's a pool client account, but generally they provide it fast. Yeah. EMIs don't have that, and it has to go through an administrator who will take a lot longer. Yeah. Plus, the administrator can take their fees off it, so you won't actually get your money back. You'll get your money get back less. less, about 1% or 2%. And the problem is, it's straight back on, on, your, on your plate, which mm. is what you're prepared to accept, because at the end of the day, you're insuring this stuff. Mm. Now, what is really interesting about this, of course, is that, is that agent redress schemes don't insure against banks, they insure against collapse of agents. Insolvency, yeah. So if the agent collapses, 
that doesn't mean that the EMI still doesn't have the agent's money sitting in a client account, mm. in which case there's nothing there for you to cover mm. because the money will be paid out mm. um, by a different administrator for sure. But but it's not, it's, and, and you might have to be liable for a, a small amount of top up mm. on the administrator's fees. But that's that's a limit. But you're not there to cover a situation where an agent has a client account with an EMI and the EMI collapses. That that's not your problem as mm. such. I mean, uh, obviously, the collapse of that EMI might lead to that agent collapse. Yeah, I think that that that's. I think the f- from a, from client protection schemes, the client money protection schemes, that is the issue. Yeah. Is with a traditional bank, the agent has control of it. Yeah. Now, we can argue all day long whether the agent's doing it. Well, well this is actually right where it gets really fascinating. But the with an EMI, who else has got control of that money? Yeah. But and in the event of a problem, does that create further claims that back into the letting agent market because they can't access the money, yeah, and therefore they go insolvent? And I think, I mean, let's not debate what, what, what you know, we could be here for hours well, talking well, about what's the out, what do you, where do you think this is going? Well, I mean, the thing that makes it really fascinating there, which I think is really interesting, is that actually one thing you can do with the MIs as an agent, if you've got an account directly with an EMI, is actually you can open up accounts for all of your landlords with that EMI, but you have titular control over those accounts. Mm. Now, if I do that, am I actually doing dealing with client money at all? Because mm. all the money I have is not in my bank account. It's actually in those landlords' bank accounts with that EMI, and they've all been KYC by that EMI. So, so no one's done that yet, but, no, uh, but, no. but the IT makes that reasonably possible. Do you think letting agents should be, um, very quickly on this, do you think letting agents should be more transparent with their landlords and tenants as to who actually is holding the money? Oh, yes, for sure. Because that's another problem uh, we, I mean, if you take the, the ARPM collapse, which yeah, was not an EMI. To be fair, no, no, it was something. But one of the problems, uh, client money protect my deposits and other deposit and client money schemes had, was that the landlords and the aid the tenants were blissfully unaware that their money wasn't being held by it ARPM. It was actually being, uh, it wasn't yeah. held by the agent. It was being held by ARPM. And, and the problem with the client money regulations is that is that they're badly drafted mm. i mean for, for one they talk about agents holding client money agents don't hold client money i mean you could argue it's open to argue that agents never hold client money it's held by a bank mm. in an agent's bank account but they're not they're not holding it no it's not, it's not under a mattress somewhere yeah, right. so one of the problems is but they that, have access to it yeah yes. but one of the problems is that is that the regulations are terribly worded because they mm. talk about agents holding money which they don't in fact hold mm. um it's you with have a, access to it's it. with a bank account yeah but it also never properly anticipated the perfectly anticipatable scenario that agents would then turn to third-party providers, and ARPM was one of them. EMIs are a slightly, slightly safer, potentially robust, robust yeah. uh, third-party provider. They're regulated provider. at least. Yeah, it's a bit more regulated. <laughs> um, and the difficulty is that that that, and, and oddly enough, you know, solicitors have been through the same party because actually small firms of solicitors obviously have to maintain client accounts. They're quite heavily regulated to get audited. Yeah. There's all kinds of costs. And actually, there are now third-party providers in the sector which are approved by the SRA. But, of course, helped by the fact that there is a central regulator for solicitors and, I think and, and agents don't have that. Absolutely. That's and right, I think yeah. this is a problem coming back to the whole discussion, moment. just to wrap the whole debate up a bit, <laughs> is that what... Is how do you regulate it? Yeah, what, what the market needs is consistency, yeah? And it needs a set of rules that are not open to interpretation to the extent that they are if you take well, you need some interpretation because because otherwise you I understand that, your but market. if you take this emi issue we're talking about now cm protect client money protect says we'll do it we'll mm. protect them property mark or money shield or won't. safe turn around and say they won't do it mm. the tenant blissfully unaware they've given they've found a property through Sure. an agent that happens to be a member of property mark and suddenly there's no their client money protection scheme ultimately won't won't cover it therefore the tenant is at risk but if he comes to a client an agent that happens to be protected by client money protect it's a different story we have this with deposit schemes we have this with redress but some different of this is interpretation. about lack of enforcement again i mean i mean that that's my which, issue which, with which, um, the legislation. which local authority mm. 
has written to you guys saying, just do tell us about which agents Absolutely. are signed up to CMP so we can double check that Absolutely. all the ones that no have one. a CMP no. logo on their website are in fact CMP members. Absolutely. Um, or mm. which, which local authority has written to agents and said, oh, mm. we see you say you're a member of Money Shield. Can you just prove that to us? Mm. Or we see actually you don't mention any. Because I don't have the time to be able to do Because, that. because um, again, the government's lumped more and more weird and wonderful <laughs> responsibilities yeah. and said, oh, oh, by the way, local authority, you just enforce all of these things, yeah. which you don't really understand. Yes. Um, and we won't explain to you, but, but, and we won't give you any money to do, but chop, chop. So just to wrap up on yeah. that whole EMI, the answer to everyone listening is we don't know yet. Is there isn't an answer. <laughs> but the the debate debate goes and, and I should yeah. be very clear that the renters reform bill won't provide you that answer no, because yeah. because it's an act of parliament mm. and you're talking about regulations. Mm. I agree. In fact, I agree. the Secretary of State, if he was so minded, could re- could answer this question uh, I said a stroke of a pen, but by amending the regulation. He mm. has the power to fix it tomorrow mm. if he so wished. Mm. He has other things on his mind. This yeah. I was going to say, he's right. up in his place. I have, I have written to him for, on behalf of clients <laughs> about it. I'm quite sure you have raised it, yeah, but it's not the priority. 